I'm Skylar Cunningham with Lean Frontiers, and I will serve as your host today. You can see on the screen Bella Engelbach, who will be presenting for us today. Bella is the author of Creativity Lean, How to Get Out of Your Own Way and Drive Innovation Throughout Your Organization. She was trained as a scientist and still loves to search for knowledge. Now she helps people to see that the heart of improvement is a scientific method. Bella is a creative problem solver, facilitator, who is also trained in continuous improvement, lean improvement, lean product and process development, and change management. She previously worked at Johnson & Johnson, where she was a senior process excellence and business improvement leader, bringing the worlds of lean and creativity together in research and development, regulatory affairs, and IT implementations. She opened her own business, Lean for Humans Incorporated, in 2018. Bella has another webinar scheduled for March 30th and a workshop scheduled for May 5th. If you have not yet checked those out, you can find them at leanfrontiers.com under the workshops and online learning tabs. Also, during this presentation, my camera will stay on, so don't be alarmed when you see both of us. I will now hand it over to Bella. Thanks, Skyla, and hello, everyone, and I hope you're having a great day. So today we are going to talk about why your A3s don't deliver innovative solutions and what you can do about it. And what we're going to focus on today is starting your A3. But before we get into talking about A3s, I want to talk about creativity and what's required for creativity, because creativity is what drives innovation. So if you want an innovative solution, you have to be able to use creative thinking. And uh, there are two kinds of thinking that are actually essential to being creative. So if we can understand those, we'll have a better idea of what's going on uh, when we get into our A3s. So the two types of thinking that we need to think about and use a divergent thinking and convergent thinking. And you're gonna hear me say that a lot, divergent thinking and convergent thinking. And you'll often see me making this hand motion. I noticed I do this, divergent thinking and convergent thinking. And there's a reason for that. So what is divergent thinking? Divergent thinking is what a lot of people think of when they think about creativity. It's when you are a group of people able to come up with multiple ideas, multiple options, multiple ways of moving forward. It's about thinking broadly and expansively. It's about not putting limits on your thinking. And one way I like to think of divergent thinking is about the idea of being in the writer's mind. So when you are in the writer's mind, you are able to sit down, as an example, and write and not stop, not look back at what you've written, just keep writing and writing. And ideally, you get into some kind of a flow and are able to write. Now, a lot of people have trouble doing that, and there's a reason for that. But, but divergent thinking is this expansive, and you'll see again, my hand motion is the expansive uh, way of thinking, where you're allowing and coming up with lots of possibilities. Divergent thinking by itself is great, but it doesn't necessarily get things done. And that's why we need the balance in our, in our creative thinking with convergent thinking. Convergent thinking is when we select or strengthen and strengthen our ideas and our options. When we pick, decide what we're going to do, when we make choices, and we can think of that as being in the editor's mind. So when you're in the editor's mind, that means you're stopping, you're looking at what, at what you've done, you're making decisions about it, perhaps you will be taking something out, you'll be adding something back in, perhaps you will be um, changing some sentence structure, you might move things around. So divergent thinking, thinking expansively, convergent thinking is making choices about what you have thought expansively about. Now, if you're like most people, you are stronger personally 
in divergent thinking or convergent thinking. And there are lots of shades and variations of that. For example, in convergent thinking, there are people who are really good at refining. And so their strength might be taking an idea and refining it and moving it forward. In divergent thinking, you often have people who are terrific ideators other people are wonderful at combining ideas and taking two ideas and saying, how might these go together and come up with a third idea? So there are lots of different shades of those, but there's the very important thing to recognize is that we all have strengths and we can all build strengths in both convergent and divergent thinking. Okay, so you're with me so far? Now, here's the interesting thing. Remember I said, we have this idea about you know, the writer that sits down and just writes and writes and writes, but most of us personally don't have that experience. When we sit down to write something, we stop. And then we look at it, we decide it wasn't very good and we scratch it out. And some people even get writer's block because they, start, they, they stop the divergent writer thinking and go straight into the editor's mind. Now, there's a neurological secret to this, and the neurological secret is that divergent thinking and convergent thinking actually take place in different parts of our brains. And I know that a lot of us think that we can multitask, that we can do two things at once, but really, apart from breathing and maintaining our bodily functions, we really, when it comes to thinking, can only do one thing at a time. We can really only think uh, one thing at a time. So we can only think divergently or convergently. And the sad truth is, as soon as we start to think convergently, we can no longer think divergently. And that's really a big issue. Um, so, and I apologize for that. There is snow falling off my roof. If you just heard a big roar. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so when we are Wanting to be creative, it's very important to recognize the times when we want to be doing divergent thinking, what are the times we want to do convergent thinking and do them at different times. Now, there are two questions that you can kind of keep in your mind uh, to mark whether you are in a divergent thinking stage or a convergent thinking stage. When you are in a divergent thinking stage, the question that you really want to be asking all the time is some variation of what are all the, so allowing for the idea that there are a lot of possibilities. And then in convergent thinking, it really the question is, which do we choose? And often is which one do we choose to move forward with? And why did that happen? I apologize for that too. All right, so with divergent thinking and convergent thinking, fortunately there are guidelines and these have been developed over the years by the folks who practice uh, creative problem solving. So let's look at the guidelines for divergent thinking. When you wanna do divergent thinking, the, the first and most important thing to do is to defer judgment. And that simply means when an idea is, comes up, it's presented, whether it's an idea that you come up with while you're brushing your teeth or it's an idea you come up with in a brainstorming session, just let it be. Don't automatically say it's a good idea or a bad idea. Mm -hmm. Secondly, remember I talked about people who are good at combining, combine and build ideas mm -hmm. together. Somebody says something, somebody else says something, a, a, a second idea, what would be it be like if you combine those two things? Thirdly, and then when we're talking about innovation, we want innovation in our A3s. This is super important. We want to seek wild ideas. We want to be comfortable with going for the crazy, right? So look for, right, for wild ideas, ask for wild ideas. And then finally, the final guideline is go for quantity. And it's not the quantity in and of itself is necessarily great, but as you go for quantity, you are more and more likely to get to wild ideas, which will help you drive your innovation. So of course, if there are guidelines for divergent thinking, there are also guidelines for convergent thinking. The first is to be deliberate. Now, those of us who are practicing lean thinking often have no problem being deliberate with our convergent thinking. We have a lot of tools for doing convergent thinking and we love those tools. We try to use those tools a lot. 
But when I say be deliberate in your con convergent thinking, what that means is don't necessarily do it too fast. Think through it carefully. If you spent a while coming up with a lot of options, spend a similar amount of time deciding how you're going to move forward. Check your objectives. If you started out to do something, and you'll see this once we look at A3, if you started out to do something, make sure you have that objective in mind as you are going through your convergent thinking activity. This is a great time to improve your ideas because almost no idea is perfect when it's first born. Be affirmative, which means that you look for the positives in ideas and you ask questions like, how might we improve this idea rather than saying, hey, this idea kind of stinks. And finally, because we went for those wild ideas when we were thinking divergently, we want to consider novelty. We want to value interesting new ideas as we're going through convergent thinking. Because it's very easy for us in lean with our excellent convergent thinking, picking, choosing types of tools to throw out the novel things, right? Because they make us a little bit uncomfortable or they don't fit into what we know. So keep these guidelines in mind. All right, so let's talk quickly about A3s. Presumably you're here because you know something about A3s. Um, A3 problem solving is, and this is very important, is a coached approach to problem solving. And it's really appropriate, a single A3 is appropriate for kind of a medium sized problem. A single A3 is not something you do for a business level strategy problem. And it's probably too much for a problem that you could solve in an afternoon. Um, the reason it's called A3 is because the story of the problem is documented on a size on a piece of paper, the size of, of A3 paper, uh, which in the US is ledger size paper. And traditionally, this is done by hand with a pencil. Um, so you can draw pictures. Uh, a lot of people are using PowerPoint and things nowadays, but, but uh, traditionally it's done by hand with pencil and eraser. So you can change things, right? Um, A3s are very helpful to solve problems in new product development or any time that you need an innovative solution to a problem. So they are just, uh, the, just the thing for when you really need to come up with a solution that is one that is not a solution or a countermeasure that you know somebody else is using. If you want to learn more about A3s, lots of great courses out there. And of course, a John Shook's wonderful book, Managing to Learn. Okay, now remember A3 is a coached process. It is, it is about solving the problem. It's not necessarily about the size of the piece of paper. But the really cool thing about A3 and divergent and convergent thinking is that the size of the paper and the size of those boxes that you have on the A3 really forces you into doing convergent thinking to decide what goes into and onto is actually ends up being documented in the A3 as you summarize your thinking. But you could have a great A3 and still not have an innovative solution. You could have just the nicest looking A3 in the world and not get to that solution or that new product or that new product feature. Um, and there's a couple of reasons why that might not happen. The first is you might be doing ineffective divergent thinking. Ineffective divergent thinking means that you have not spent enough time, energy, or given enough space to your divergent thinking process. Frequently divergent thinking in an A3 gets stopped because people are worried about time. Um, I don't have time to go and explore another option. I'm, not, I'm just not going to do that. Or it gets stopped because the person who is using the A3, the learner, or the coach actually is uncomfortable with divergent thinking. They want to get to a countermeasure or a solution quickly. And so they will kind of skip through the divergent thinking. It might be a little scary actually to propose some things uh, if it, depending on the environment you're in. Ineffective convergent thinking can also happen in A3, and that often has to do with the fact 
that you, uh, the, that you're kind of ignoring one of those guidelines. You might be ignoring the guideline of being deliberate. You might be ignoring the guideline of considering novelty. So you want to have all those guidelines in mind. So what does this look like uh, for the for the problem solver, for the learner, the person who is actually working on A3? They should be planning and expecting to do both divergent thinking and convergent thinking as they're working on their A3. They should be planning and expecting to keep divergent thinking and convergent thinking separate. So now I'm thinking divergently about this. Now I'm thinking convergently, not doing them at the same time. And they should really be following the guidelines as they are doing both the divergent and the convergent thinking. Now, if you're coaching the A3, remember, this is a coach process. You, this is your opportunity to ask the person who's working on the A3, ask your learner questions about their thinking at any particular point. You can ask a question like, do you think to need to be thinking divergently right now? Perhaps you should be thinking convergently. You could ask a question like, what are all of the options that you considered? Are there other options that perhaps you wanted to explore but you didn't explore? Or you could ask questions about, about convergence. Did you, how did you pick the tool that you, did, that you picked in order to decide how to move forward? What was your decision process about choosing your next step? So those are good, some good convergent, uh, that divergent and convergent thinking questions to ask the, ask the person you're coaching. You too, as the coach, you can help your problem solver keep their divergent and convergent thinking separate. So if you see somebody, you know, come to you with an A3 that's already complete, that's immediately a sign. They have already, they've already gone through basically a convergent thinking process. They think they know what the solution is. They just wrote it all down. That was convergent. They probably skipped most of the divergent thinking. And again, as a coach, you should be following the guidelines. And the most important guideline for the coach to remember is that very first one for divergent thinking. That is reserve judgment. So when a learner comes to you with something that looks different, something that you've seen before and you know it doesn't work, don't say to them, I can see Skylar laughing. Don't say, that, ah, that'll never work. You don't even need to go down that path. When you are doing that, you are doing two things. First of all, you're cutting off what might be a good idea, right? But if, if it's better fleshed out. And secondly, what you're teaching the person who's solving the problem is don't come to me with unusual ideas. You're never going to get innovation that way. So the role of the coach, how the coach acts when they see interesting, different, novel stuff coming from the learner is going to make a really big difference in the A3 and the success of the A3 in delivering innovation. All right, so let's take a look at the left side of the A3, which is kind of where you get your A3 started. And then the next webinar, I'll be talking about finishing up the A3. So um, hopefully you can see this. Let's start by looking at the title of the A3. The title of the A3 is where you are going to concisely state the problem that you are trying to solve. Um, in my experience, when you're working on an A3, that title is going to change quite a few times. But my first suggestion for you is to consider stating the problem affirmatively. And so remember, affirmatively means that we're going to say, say it in a way that it's positive. So rather than, than stating something like, we've got to solve um, you know, the, the problem of... Um, not enough uh, new, um, new actually not enough new ideas coming out of this organization. You can state that affirmatively as a how might we get more new ideas out of this organization. Another affirmative way to state a problem is to state it as a, it would be great. You could say it would be great if this organization was delivering tons of new ideas. 
not the F, I don't know if I'd say tons in the title of an A3, but affirmative, stating the title affirmatively, what does that do? What that says to people is, we think there's a solution out there. All we got to do is find it, right? It's already starting us in a good positive place for some, some good um, innovative thinking. So. The next section of the A3, many A3s is the background. And this is kind of where you tell the story of where did this problem come from? How do we get here? And so in this, uh, in this section, in this, in the, and it's not just a section, in this part of the problem solving process, you can, you can think divergently and then you can think convergently. So an example of a divergent question to ask when getting ready to understand the background of a problem is to ask who can tell you about the history of the problem? And in fact, you could even say, who are all the people who can tell me the history of this problem? And that would might make, if you ask who are all the people who can tell me the history of the problem, that might help you not skip somebody who might have some interesting information that will help you understand the problem. And then when you get to convergent thinking, again, keep your divergent and convergent thinking separate, which parts of the story are most important for me to document here? So you're gonna to have to choose which parts of that story, you heard all this information from all these people, you looked at all this data about the history of the problem, what is really important? And so you're gonna to have to really think solidly with your convergent thinking, decide what's going to go on the A3 and really tell this story well. Same thing with your current conditions. We want to think divergently. What is out there that might give us data that we have not considered before? If we really want to understand the current condition, we're going to have to look at some broad, um, some broad applications that perhaps we hadn't thought about before. What are all the voices we could listen to? Maybe you're going to do voice of the customer. Well, who are all the voices that we want to, we want to listen to? Convergent thinking. Again, which data and information have I heard, has the learner heard, that is going to be the most important to help us move forward? And, and, and I think, I hope you're, as you're hearing me talk, you're thinking about this thing. Well, that's a lot, right? Like doing all that divergent thinking and then coming back and doing the convergent thinking, deciding what's really important. And part of that is in the coaching process, right? It's in that discussion between the learner and the coach. What is important? What will help us move forward? What will, what will help us then set some goals and targets? Again, divergent thinking, convergent thinking. Now we wanna set some goals or targets for what our improved state's gonna be like. This is a wonderful place to do some brainstorming on, have some fun with it. When this problem and solve, is solved, it would be great if, list all the things that would be great. Somewhere in there, there may be a measure that we want to use um, to determine um, what our goal should be going forward. Divergent thinking against, once you've decided what you might, might want to measure, you might not know how to measure it. So what are all the ways that we could measure these attributes of our potential future state? And then convergent, which of those are going to provide us a nice set of measures so we can see whether we've achieved the future state? And now that's going to take us into our analysis. And there's so many opportunities when you're doing analysis to do divergent and convergent thinking. What are the potential root causes? What are all the potential root causes? How many bones does your fishbone diagram actually have, right? Plenty of bones on the fish. Convergent thinking is then making that decision. Which of these root causes are the most important to address? Which could we address first? And that's going to take us then into our experimentation. So um, if we don't know, um, actually doing an experiment is a very good convergent thinking activity because you can do an experiment to decide whether something's important, effective, if it makes a difference. Divergent thinking, again, what are all the ways that we could, all the ways we could test our root cause hypothesis? You know, somebody might know a great way, but maybe if we want innovation, we want to find another one. Remember when the White Wright brothers were building the first airplane, 
uh, the first uh, powered airplane, they had to invent many of the tests that they used as well as inventing the airplane. So many times you are gonna have to come up with a new test. And then conversion thinking, which test will give us the best fastest confirmation for the least cost? So there's just some ways to make sure you, to you using divergent and convergent thinking separately on the left side of your A3. And oh my goodness, we're almost out of time and we're not done. We haven't done the right side of the A3. So come back on March the 30th, uh, register at the Lean Frontiers website. We'll talk about the right side of the A3 and uh, how, we, um, how we come up with our countermeasures and how we can actually evaluate our countermeasures coming up with the countermeasures, divergent, convergent, picking the kind of measures to move forward with. And then I'm gonna be doing a workshop um, on May the 5th, where we'll be able to see each other and discuss and actually practice doing this. So I'd love to have you join me for that workshop as well. So I'll go to leanfrontiers.com to register for those. Um, and then uh, if you wanna read more about this, I have a book uh, called Creatively Lean, How to Get Out of Your Own Way and Drive Innovation Throughout Your Organization. And you can email me, my email address is on the next slide, um, or find me on LinkedIn and I'll hook you up with um, getting a signed copy. So um, that's how to get further along. And I think we have just a couple minutes uh, to answer one or two questions. If you want to put them in the chat. Thank you, David. Ah, here's a good question. Do we apply the, the same rules to proposal A3s. Yes, you, you absolutely can. So everywhere in your, in your A3, in every section, there are opportunities for divergent and convergent thinking. And you're gonna get, you're gonna get more bang out of your A3 buck, so to speak. If, we, if you think about, uh, do I need to be divergent here or do I need to be convergent here? So whether it's, it's a proposal A3, which you know, obviously you wanna consider a number of different things before you actually decide what's gonna be in your proposal or any other type of A3, there's opportunities. And in the next um, uh, uh, webinar, I am gonna talk about how we even apply divergent and convergent thinking inside your plan to check act or Lambda cycle. So yes, absolutely. What creative problem solving process do you recommend? I just, uh, hi David. I love actually uh, original CPS. Um, uh, there's lots of different variations on that and um, great resources for that um, at, uh, I'm, um, I'm blanking on the website, but uh, if you just uh, look up creative problem solving um, on Google, there's tons of wonderful resources and tools out there. Just logistics, will these slides go out? Skyla, can you answer that question? Hi, yes, um, I can send these directly out to you. Um, they are not posted online, so I can send these out to everybody. And Helen, I think you and I are also connected on LinkedIn, so um, we can uh, get them. Yes, we are. We are connected. Yeah. So thank you very much, everyone. This has been this has been fantastic for me. I wish I could see all your all your faces, and I'm looking forward to the next webinar, finishing out that A3, and um, having um, having some time with you in in a workshop to actually play with all of this stuff. So thanks very much, and thank you, Skylar. Thank you, Bella. Thank you to everybody who participated today and for logging in and sending your questions to Bella. We look forward to seeing you in the next webinar with Bella. Have a great day. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.